started now. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, for today's meeting, the agenda. Just one second. Hmm. So the first thing on the agenda is uh, update on our get redundant fetch issue. And uh, one thing I did, so we had three behaviors which we had to add to the clone API, which is the API uh, needed to uh, check out for the first time. So uh, those, those three behaviors, the first one was clean before checkout. And we don't need that because we've found out that for the first time, we don't need a clean because there is no Git repository. The second behavior was pruning stale branches before checkout. And the third is pruning stale tags. So while I was, so I already implemented all of these behaviors in the clone API. And while I was writing the unit tests for these uh, additions, I discovered that um, if we're, if you're building a repository for the first time, we would not need pruning stale branches or stale tags because stale uh, remote references, we won't have references to them before the build because we don't even have a repository. So at that time, I realized that we don't need to add these two behaviors to the clone API step. So, uh, so that's a discovery recent discovery and I think that makes things easier because the only change we have is related to unit tests now and I think the fix is good to go because we had we had to add we have we had to cover all the u possible use cases we would miss if we would avoid the second fetch uh, the redundant one and I think we have covered all of those cases Mark what would you say well, so, uh, well, so yeah. I think there's more to test, but we may be at the point now where the best form of testing is interactive, where we do some explore, exploration of various permutations and combinations of job settings to see, hey, did this deliver us what we expected with some interactive tests? I, I was so dismayed by the realization that I didn't understand personally the the, the, the conditions around around uh, prune and clean, and we had to be taught by a test, an automated test, so there's there's more work to do there in terms of the interactive testing. Okay, so how would we go about it, Mark? The second, my second question is, the second agenda is the further action needed to merge the fix to the master branch. How, how should we plan that? Yeah, so one thing that I was thinking of is maybe what we need is, interactive testing that takes uh, let's say the set of available parameter available extensions arguments and chooses a subset of them and then says okay i want to run these without with the redundant fetch and without and compare the repositories in the workspaces that result so we have some form of repository comparison did we get all the references we expected did we get all the branches we expected uh, were the ref specs correct and my worry okay. is that if if they aren't correct some subtle thing will be introduced by removing the redundant fetch that that someone will say hey you broke me because you removed this subtle thing on which i depended okay okay that sounds like a great plan i can i can start that for this interactive testing yeah, now, now my usual game plan with that kind of interactive testing is the interactive testing is intentionally rapid. The goal is not to make it particularly repeatable, just to keep notes as you go. But then when okay. you find a real problem, that's the excuse to write an automated test eventually, which says show the problem. Okay. But if we focus on automating it too soon, we spend all our time on the automation without doing the exploration. Sure, I understand that. Okay. So, uh, so after this, uh, the next thing on the agenda is the discussion on uh, implementation of performance improvement into the Git plugin and the Git client plugin. So uh, last time we discussed that we could have a checkbox, uh, a way that we by default enable performance improvement and people can revert to the old changes if they want to. So, uh, so I tried doing it and I have a lot of questions related to it. Uh, so the first thing is I 
So I basically, I added this checkbox here, revert performance improvement changes. And this is linked to the descriptor class of SCM. So uh, I would like to show the code here. Just a second. I Yeah, so this is a Boolean enable performance improvement in the descriptor class. So one of the first things I have uh, in my mind, which I haven't explored right now is that where are the places I, how will I, uh, how will I ship this Boolean to every corner of the Git plugin? I understand that this descriptor, this is an object for uh, the SCM class. So when I create an SCM class, I would have this as an object and I can access. So I created a method which is uh, is basically a getter to get this Boolean. But as I understand, we need to create the client within the SCM class, within the git SCM class. So not sure if, if I'm, I'll be able to access this variable uh, within the SCM class because this is a different the the this the descriptor class is a different class right is an is basically an object to this class so i haven't explored that part if if i am plainly wrong and you can right now tell me where i'm wrong that's okay or i'm going to or else i'm going to explore this more so i just implemented it to show what i so the, the first part of this whole uh, implementation is to figure out how to uh, bring the boolean how to bring the choice the user will have to the code then the second part uh, so this is the first part now the second part which i uh, which i was thinking about is that if we need to selectively choose between implementations uh, which we'll which uh, from the analysis we get from the J, uh, jmh benchmarks to do so we know that uh, for an example for git fetch uh, the choice is heavily dependent upon the repository size and so what what i was thinking about to under so first i was thinking about how do i uh, get to know the repository size uh, of a particular repository so i was looking at a command uh, called uh, get uh, sorry, i wrote it somewhere get count objects count objects so what it does is it basically counts the unpacked Ob uh, objects and it tells the size but the issue with that uh, command is and i uh, i implemented it first and then understood the issue so the issue is that it it counts the unpacked objects and when i'm cloning the repository for the first time it would send the objects in a packed uh, in in a in a compressed manner and that would basically so i i, I wrote a small test to to check if my implementation is correct or not and i cloned uh, the git plugin repository and I tested the object size and it was zero. So that was because I, it was, it, the repository was packed. So, uh, so while I was doing this, I, I, I understood, uh, one of the re revelations I had was that I, I have to uh, realize the size of the repository before creating the client. That means one of the first question for, for, for this thing is, can I access the, the the repository I am going to use with the client I'm going to create before actually creating the client? If I'm not able to do that, then I would have to create I, I would have to clone the rep repository whenever I have to maybe for once when I have to make this decision. But then that means if I have a 300 size repository, I would I want to improve the performance and I would add a considerable amount of time while I'm cloning the repository and then estimating its size. First, it'll, it'll be packed. So maybe I would have to also include the, uh, I would have, have to implement the uh, git command for unpacking objects. That would, that would also, uh, maybe I, and then I would also have to, um, one of the, one other thing is that I would have to create a new client uh, without I maybe I would have to create a client with a temporary uh, local repository uh, for the for the life cycle of making that decision because I would not have any repository 
to create a client to check the size of the repository before creating the client for the git plugins functionalities so uh, so the first i think the first part is how do i uh, is this the right way to uh, to use the district the this descriptors class get uh, getter to uh, take the user's option and then use it to switch between implementations or revert to the old changes the second is uh, how do we go about uh, measuring the size of the repository before even creating a client yeah. so so on the first question there is yes. there is right above the right above the implementation that you did there is that show entire commit summary and changes um, so um, look for the word show entire commit sh summary in changes yes i have seen it I, yeah it's a show entire yeah there we go so so that is a pattern of this the kind of thing that i think you need to add because it uses the same exact technique it has something in the descriptor and then okay. there are things inside the Git SCM class or one of its one of its related classes, which ask the Git SCM object if show entire commit summary and changes is enabled or not. So, okay. so I think you can just leverage that. Look for it. I confess it's dealing with descriptors versus the the parent class. I don't remember any of it. I always have to go do the research. But this show entire commit summary and changes is exactly the kind of flag you need. So you can look at its usages and see, oh, here's where it's used, here's where it's referenced, and, and model your changes after that. Sure, that, that's a good way to go about it. Okay. Yeah, I think if you if I remember right, there's some uh, there's a there's a method you can use called get descriptor that will give you the descriptor for that current plugin. Uh, but yeah. I think uh, Mark's suggestion is probably the easiest one. Okay, but but what if my, my question was? But what if I I don't create an object? I I need to use the uh, this uh, this field within the plugins within the SEM class before even creating the object for that class. How? I think I, I I'll follow. Uh, I I, I think I think you can't, and you probably or you could because it's statically available, right? It's a global. So it's got to be available somehow, but I'm not sure you will actually need to. That's the piece where, where I, I suspect you'll want to make the determination, which path should I use at runtime after already instantiating it to get SCM object. I don't okay. think you're going to need to make the decision beforehand. I suspect you'll want to make it at runtime with the object already in memory and, and constructed. Okay. Hmm. And I think technically Jenkins may have already constructed it for you when it loaded plugins when it started up. But uh, yeah, the, the yeah, global you'll, you'll see some of this. Yeah, there it is. Get, get the descriptor by type in show get tool options. Oops, uh, that's down there. Anyways, <laughs> I think you'll find it. You'll see. I think Mark's suggestion is a good one to to see where that's okay. used. Okay. And then you'll start to see the chain of where that kind of comes together. It's somewhat instructive to see and run through it yourself, I think, sometimes too. So Yeah, I, I'll do that, Justin. And now it's it was easier for me to express those kind of flags if the default value was negative. So okay. so rather than enable performance improvement, you might consider naming it disable <laughs> or or let's see enable redundant fetch or or use the performance abomination but yeah you know it, it's okay i understand it and i i don't recall that this may now be cargo cult programming and i apologize if it is but but i don't remember why but it was easier for me to deal with things that had a default value of false rather than starting them with a default value of true in these in these descriptors trying to retain compatibility okay i'll then change that okay. now now your second question though was was the more challenging ask your second question again it's it's already slipped my poor feeble mind 
So I think the second uh, just to touch on that false thing, I think it's because the checkbox wouldn't be available in previous Jenkins installations. So keeping it as false uh, would maintain like previous compatibility. Right. Oh yeah. So Very Jelly's going to be Jelly's not going to have any XML config before. Mm. Okay. I. I think I think that's what you're talking about. Sorry, go ahead. And, uh, that's a great point. Oh, oh, it was sizing. I remember your second question, Rishab. It yeah, was about I was, how do uh, I deduce the size? So some speculation. All right, first, I think we're looking for a fallible rule, a heuristic, that, that could help us make the decision which path to take. And we've okay. got some, some information already available to contribute to this fallible rule because in order to in order to list the branches on a repos repository, we do a git ls remote. So one piece of the fallible rule might be to say, if a repository has more than some threshold of branches, we will assume, you know, try to do a correlation between branch count and approximate repository size. It's okay. fallible. We know it is. We absolutely know it's fallible, but it's cheap because we're already asking that question. And so we can use the answer from that question to already, if we remember the question, if we remember the answer or remember data from the answer, we could then use that, that as part of our decision. Oh, okay. I saw, well, I saw a repository that had 500 branches. It's probably not a one megabyte repository. It's probably That's more towards, yeah. more towards the, the large size than the small size. Now, there are plenty of repositories that have two branches and are still hundreds of megabytes. So, so it is a fallible rule, but, but one thing would be use git ls remote because we're already calling it. I okay. really liked your idea and I thought it was brilliant to use, to ask, look for git commands that might tell us the size of the local repository if we've got one. Because yeah. count objects, there are probably things like it which will count inside pack files as well. So I think it's it's worth exploring that further to see what's available. Okay, but but the only concern there is that if but we would have to clone the repository to do that, right? Right, right, and and that that for me is a non-starter. You should not. Yeah, exactly. The heuristic exactly. has to give us an answer without requiring a, a an extra clone, right? Because an extra clone will exactly sabotage the entire goal. Yeah. So uh, I am here concerned of one of the behavior of Git LFS. So uh, will that affect your decision, Rishab? Git the LFS. Long file? Yes. Like, uh, does it matter in your? Uh, so it's like uh, it will just maintain a pointer in your actual Git repository to some larger file that actually is there. So it will not consider the size of that. It's. I think you've got a very good point, Om Omkar. It's. The fun part there is that LFS objects are cached into the .git directory as well. So, Rishab, okay. if you ask for the disk usage, literal disk usage on the drive of the .git directory, that's a very, very good approximation if you've got it. So if, if you've got a local clone, you can, you can certainly ask the question because LFS, LFS is an important one to consider. Excellent point, Omkar, that we, yeah. Certainly, if LFS is in use, that's probably a hint this is a big repository. Right. It's not a guarantee, but it's probably a good hint. Okay. So, uh, yeah, another way you could handle oh, actually, it for like things like GitHub and GitLab is you could potentially, like, that could be something that for something like that, it's not generalizable for everything Git, but it would maybe be an optimization for GitHub and GitLab is that you could check their API or use the APIs to get the repository size potentially. That now that that is a that is a very bold bold one because this would be the first time you're int someone's introducing REST API calls into the Git plugin. All of the REST API calls are done by higher level plugins like GitHub and GitLab and Giddy. So, but but I think Justin's got a good point that. That would be another way to another really excellent heuristic is those those providers may have API calls that will tell you the approximate size of the repository by a single API call. Hmm. Does do the GitHub and GitLab plugins? Uh, I'm a little rusty on on these bits, but would they pass down information like that from 
into the Git plugin. Because uh, that's another possibility is you could like localize that into each of those plugins since they're already calling those APIs. So create create some sort of an interface in those upper level plugins that says, "Hey, provide me an a, an estimate of remote repository size." Mm -hmm. That that'd be Something worth like considering that. as well. Yeah, that's an interesting. I'm sure idea. there's a number of options, but yeah, right. <laughs> that, I hadn't thought of that. I think that's a very good idea. Okay, so that that would need for that I would need to create an implementation in the plugins which use the Git plugin related to GitLab or Git GitHub, right? Okay. Right, and hmm. so for that one, it, every, as soon as you involve another plugin, you're also contingent on their release of that plugin for you delivering that future. So it's it's much more challenging. It it it's architecturally very elegant, but it can be more challenging for you. It feels like though you may, Rishab, we may have we have, may have de described that there is something like a uh, a class that you'll need inside inside the Git plugin doesn't exist yet that says um, estimate the repository size or something about repository size heuristic, and and we admit it's heuristic, it's fallible, but but then it it collects data from various sources. To give you your your size size guesses. No, that might be a good class. Okay. Yeah, maybe you start with implementing something into Git plugin itself. That's like the best generalizable kind of way of doing it. You add, you use this class, provide that to uh, the other classes, and then maybe those plugins implement that later. That's not necessarily the scope of your work. Or if we have time, then maybe you add that something like that. Well, yeah, that's okay. possibility too. To support Justin's idea, Jenkins has the concept of an extension point that allows other plugins to add their to add to you, and so you could conceivably create this as an extension point in the Git plugin, which others, if they wanted to contribute to it, and say, "Hey, I want to provide an even better implementation than the Git plugin's naive implementation," they could do that through this extension point system. Okay. Yeah, that's a great point. Provided as an extension. Okay. Yeah, and it's I think it's called an is it an extension point? I uh, I'll have to look it up. It's I'll send it to you separately. I think there's a there's a specific page on Jenkins.io that lists all the known Jenkins extension points. Okay. Okay. Extensions index is what it's called. Yes. And and yeah, they call it extension points. Okay, good. I'll put it into the meeting notes, Rishab. Okay, Matt. So uh, one more question I had uh, related to the Git plugin was the SCM API. Um, I have read the uh, SCM consumer and implementation guides, but I have never uh, mapped that with how, uh, I know the Git SCM class, but I haven't mapped all of it uh, with how Git plugin is using the SCM APIs. So I wanted to ask how much of that should I research before uh, thinking of implementing this feature of performance improvement, how much should I? Uh, is that is that is that something I need to do first so that I can do all of these things, or is it something I can do parallelly while I'm uh, implementing performance I, improvement? I think you could do it in parallel or even after, because the concepts that you're introducing are below the level of the SCM API. They are specifics to get internally. I don't think anything we've described so far, any possible exception maybe is that if, if you ultimately decide that you want to allow implementations to offer a better way of estimating the size of a repository, that might need an addition to the, to the SCM API. Okay. But, but my guess for right now is you, you, this is entirely inside the Git plugin for now. So the sophisticated and very capable things that are inside SCM can be largely ignored. 
but okay. but uh, Fran is better experienced than this than I am. I suspect that Justin, I don't know about your experience in it, but my hunch is that it's probably above a level that that you're that that you're not working at. Okay. Yeah, I, I think you're right. From my experience, um, I've been at a different level. <laughs> I've been at the uh, higher level in the SEM API generally. Um, so I'm, but I, I think I would say the same thing. Fran, do you have any other, other thoughts from the Git perspective? I think, I think Justin and, and Mark are totally right. So. Cool. Okay. Great. But it's definitely interesting to, to learn about. So yeah, I think parallel or or after seem like good ways. Okay, just so I guess these are my concerns right now. And um, so for uh, I think for the next week, one of the possible tasks I have is first is to interact interactively test. Uh, the the git redundant fetch fix uh, with the possible combinations permutation and combinations and uh, the second is to probably uh, decide or test these heuristics we've mentioned possible heuristics and uh, create an extension if I can right that would be uh, the tangible outcome of another task I can have to create an extension which would provide uh, heuristic to calculate the size of a repository. Yeah, and I, I'm not worried about it being an extension point, but something that represents the estimate of repository size, I think is a good thing. It doesn't, it, 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 to my mind, it doesn't, it absolutely does not need to be an extension point. You don't need that complexity yet. It's, okay. it's more of Cap remembering the, the 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 statistics from Git LS Remote is probably enough to do the job that you need. If you remember, hey, this thing the last time it did LS Remote, it had this many branches. That's a simple integer to remember. It's not going to bloat the class too badly. And okay. but then you can use that in, in as part of your approximations. And where would I introduce that in the uh, in the Git plugin? Is suppose if I if I create a class which uh, which gives me the result of the repository size, where would I uh, where would I how would I use that in the Git SCM class? So is that something I should explore? I, I think you'll need to ex yeah look for look for the callers of Git LS Remote, and okay. the they'll be part of. The, see if you can find a place logically that makes sense to attach a little bit of data into those colors, the places where you'll need it. Okay. Okay, Matt. Uh, Rishal, I have one uh, concern over here. So, uh, did you mention that uh, count object uh, call rate right, on Git? Yes. So, uh, did you use it with like the verbose mode or like without verbose mode? Uh, no, without verbose. Without so I, think, I think that verbose mode gives the size of the packed objects also. So you can consider consider that. Okay. Case. Check it. I, I didn't I didn't check that. Okay. Yeah. I'll add that argument. Sure. Okay. And I guess another thing that I thought about too, and I'm not sure how simple this is uh, behind the scenes. I know there are some Jenkins plugins that will cache some things. Uh, so you could maybe like if you've seen a Git repository before, that workspace is gone, that agent's gone, you don't have access to it anymore, but your instance has seen that repo before, perhaps there's a way to, to store that information on, uh, for the, uh, the primary Jenkins. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any experience with those APIs. I've seen it done, I don't know how it's how it's done because I haven't done it myself with the plugin. Yeah, I don't have experience with Maybe it. Maybe it's too complicated. <laughs> API for caching. Yeah. Yep. Well, well there is no real API for caching. Uh, there is uh, a piece of code which has been copy pasted between uh, plugins with some level of success. 
And yeah, I believe we had a discussion uh, about that maybe one year ago uh, because uh, it creates a lot of issues with backup management, etc. Because yeah, right now we do not have a standard for caching anything in uh, Jenkins. So if you want to define something like that as a part of your project, uh, I would be happy to see that. But right now there is no central <laughs> solution. Okay. So I uh, think this is it. These are the agendas I wanted to discuss. And uh, I'll work on the tasks I mentioned for this week, for the next week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one thing, uh, do you plan to do communications for the current uh, evaluation results? Because I believe that uh, we already have some data from performance testing. So maybe it's something to share with the community. Or do you plan to integrate everything into a single blog post? Um, well, like I could, I think I can do both. I mm -hmm. can initially for, you know, for, for, for the time being, uh, tomorrow I have a demo in the platform SIG meeting. Maybe uh, with that, I can release uh, uh, in the de in the community in the Google group form. Uh, I can post uh, with the results I have, and then uh, when I when I have multiple results with multiple Git operations, I can create a blog and aggregate all of those results and then. Yeah, works for yeah. me. So okay, I'll I'll do that for tomorrow. Great, and I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow in the platform SIG. Sure, Mark. Yeah. I'll probably work on the uh, benchmarks later to the redundant fetch to show what kind of mm -hmm. performance differences we would have by removing it. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Mm -hmm. Rishab, anything else that you need from us? Anything else that we no. can help with? No, uh, I think I've discussed what I wanted to discuss. All right, I will archive the recording and it'll be available on the, on the list. Rishab, yeah. thank you very much. We'll talk to you tomorrow in the Platform SIG meeting. Thank you so much, okay, bye. Meet you tomorrow.